a very warm welcome to the World of Lord Russell podcast talk show. And today's show is British Sports Reporter of the Year 1998, which celebrates the life of a double winner of the British Sports Journalist of the Year Award. And he was also honoured by the prestigious Variety Club of Great Britain with their Silver Heart Trophy for his contribution to sports journalism. He is also twice winner of the Sports Story of the Year Award, the only journalist ever to win the accolade twice. He is one of the most influential football columnists for over four decades, one of the most acclaimed investigative uh, journalists for his generation on the London Evening News, Daily Mail, Daily Mirror, Daily Express, Daily Star, Daily Express and BT Sport. Yes, folks, it gives me immense pleasure to welcome on the show, Harry Harris. Welcome to the show, Harry. Yes, pleasure to be here. Cheers. So, yeah, <laughs> cheers indeed. And the pleasure's all mine. Enjoy that champagne cocktail. It looks absolutely <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> Well, as a start from the beginning, of course, like all kids, and me included as well, of course, you wanted to be a professional footballer. However, your career's admirer at school told you you weren't going to make it. How <laughs> kind of him, Harry. That was a lovely thing to say. And so you decided to become a reporter instead and joined a good sports college with a decent journalism course. Some inspiration there, Harry, of course. But what was the inspiration behind becoming a reporter and how was that journalism course? How good was it? Well, I went to Harlow um, and, uh, you know, really, uh, as things progressed, I couldn't believe that not being able to be a, a footballer, you know, I was a goalkeeper, not a very good yes. one. Um, in fact, um, my mum wrote a letter to Bill Nicholson, got a reply signed by him. Wow. And I had a trial at Spurs, but um, I was a year under Terry Brisley and Dennis Rofe and played mm. in the uh, school team. And um, they, the, the scouts came along and wanted to sign those two and not me. Oh, <laughs> so, uh, but I couldn't, I couldn't believe that um, going into sports journalism, football journalism, that they'd actually pay me to go and watch football matches. Uh, I couldn't believe it. Well, there you go. So Absolutely. That, that, that was the inspiration. Oh, oh yeah, that getting paid for anything and getting paid well is a great inspiration. I follow that tact as well, Harry. So there you are, two peas from the same pod. <laughs> you, you then joined straight out of college the North London Herald. And uh, I think sometimes they call it the Tottenham Herald, actually, but it's the North London Herald. And after a few months working at the North London Herald, you were sent on another journalism course. I love this story. When you came back, the sports editor had moved on and your boss asked the whole office, anyone know anything about sport? You put your hand up and your boss said, all right, you're the new sports editor. <laughs> so from humble beginnings, this is how your career began. I mean, that's a fabulous story, isn't it? It doesn't happen these days. Not these days, no, but <clears throat> that was what it was like back then. Uh, and uh, you really can't make it up. And there I was, you know, as a, almost a trainee journalist, suddenly becoming a sports editor. But it was lovely. I really enjoyed it. And, um, you know, the the offices were a few hundred yards from uh, the Tottenham Stadium, as it was then. Yes. Um, White Hart Lane, although White Hart Lane was where Harringay played. Not very many people know that. That's a good but, story. Um, you know, it was, it was great then to be uh, able to deal on a regular basis with Bill Nicholson, you couldn't get a better grounding. You know, uh, the best Spurs manager there ever was. And there there I was uh, in his office every week. Although I don't know whether you know the story, but um, Dave Leggett, who was my predecessor there, uh, introduced me to Bill and he said, um, you know, this is this, uh, your new local reporter. And, I said, and he said to me, well, Harry, I'm pleased to meet you. Tell me what you want. And I said, oh, well, I'd like to pop in and see you every week and uh, get a chat about the first team reserves and see how things are going so I can have an update every week. Uh, and, he, and he looked at me completely puzzled <laughs> and said, I saw your predecessor once a year. Wow. <laughs> Not once a week. He said, well, let's see how we go. We come along on Monday and we'll take it from there. Well, of course, as you know, in football, even at these clubs like Tottenham, any club, things change every week, don't they? So you've, to go every week, sensible, I think. Um, well, so your yeah, predecessor. It wasn't, wasn't for, it was a bit of a shock for Bill, but yeah. there, it, it, we um, we met every week and gave me the kind of uh, insight that I needed for the local paper. And, of course, 
having that insight on a weekly basis, you know, the evening standard, the evening news, all the national papers. Yeah. I, mean, I couldn't get rid of them. They were hovering ever, all around, you know, they wanted <laughs> to know what, what was going on. So it, it, it fast tracked me to the, to the nationals. It was, it was fabulous, but he was, he was such a wonderful character, Bill, you know, and I ended up writing his autobiography. Not yes. that he wanted to, I had to persuade him to do so. But there's so many Bill Nicholson stories that I mean they're just unbelievable. I mean, I was always in awe sitting in there in in the waiting room, waiting, waiting to see him. And uh, but he was always very welcoming. Mm. But one day, I mean, I had to catch um the bus from where I lived in Gans Hills, go up to uh, Tottenham. And then my first port of call on the Monday was to see him. And 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 one day there was, I don't know, a strike or whatever it was, and I was late. It's the first time ever. And I, and I sat there and I apologised profusely, but he didn't like people who were late and obviously had a, had a tight schedule. Mm. And, and and he said, you know, don't you get an alarm clock and you've got a watch? I said, well, you know, I'm only a young guy, I can't afford a watch and all this sort of stuff. Turned up the next Monday, an hour ahead of schedule, sitting there and I came in. And before I said anything, he said, before you do a thing, he said, I've got something for you. And he handed over a watch in a case, and I opened it up. It was inscribed by Inter Milan wow. to Bill Nicholson. It was the uh, presentation to Bill, and he gave it to me and said, there wow. you go, don't be late again. Wow. I mean, if that's not inspiring to make sure you turn <laughs> up at the ground early on, I don't know what is. That's a f have you still got the watch now? Of course you have. You know, I have no idea where it is. It's <laughs> such a long time. Yeah, stuff. Things go missing, don't you? All, we all move and everything else. Yeah. Life changes. Things get lost. But what a great story! I and mean, that obviously set a nice uh, relationship up between you both. And I would think as well, every Monday morning would be different depending on the Saturday afternoon's result, the atmosphere at the club. What was it like between a win and a loss? Forget the draws. Well, it, it was just a total professional. It didn't didn't really matter whether <laughs> yeah. he if he'd won, he was still in a bad mood. You know, so, <laughs> That have been something. I mean, Glenn Doyle told me a story once when he first was yes. a junior at Spurs, and the one thing he didn't ever want to do was bump into Bill Nicholson. Oh. They were all in, absolutely in awe and fear of him, and um, you know he he actually did so. You know, going different ways down the corridor. Yes, uh, and and, he, and Bill Nick said hello, Glenn. You know, and he was quite didn't know what to say. <laughs> it, was, it was just incredible. Oh. But um, we got on very well, and. Um, you know, I, I, I grew to, to, to get to know him very well. And it, was, it was a privilege to be in that position. An absolute privilege. And I think you once quoted, and uh, I think I've got these words right, I'd only been a journalist for six months and I was the local newspaper's sports editor. It was a dream job, getting paid to watch Spurs play all over Europe as well, I hasten to add, particularly when you're a Spurs fan yourself. I, I, you know, Harry, a dream indeed. I mean, what grounds and indeed matches were your highlights at the time? You must have been some fabulous stadiums, especially particularly in Europe at that time. I'd, well, look, I'm not even sure if I ever win a brawl prior to that. You know, oh. back in those days, you wouldn't, would you? I mean, um, but, you know, my passport was full very quickly because Spurs were very successful at that time. The first team to ever win a European trophy. And, indeed. Uh, they had an incredible team at that particular time. Uh, and we were always traveling in Europe. It was it was just it was marvelous occasions, you know. Um, Indeed, they would be fantastic occasions. What was your 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 your, fav your favorite British ground, shall we say? I, I include Scotland here and whatever. Apart from then, the old White Hart Lane, of course. What was your favorite British ground? Um, well, b back then. They were all ramshackled old stadiums. I mean, you know. It was... Well, look at Stamford Bridge. Oh, dear. Blimey. Speaks volumes. I mean, what was your favourite ground? But, you know, White Hart Lane had a magic for me because I was there in, you know, from an eight-year-old, ten-year-old, going up those Eight. steps with your season ticket, you know. that uh, You know, it was just magical, really was. The atmosphere was. Uh, and I just couldn't believe that clubs would ever move from those traditional homes, you know. Would anyone move from Highbury, White Hart Lane? And, and, and it, it yes. just begs belief ah. that you would because it, there was so much, so many ghosts that lived there. Exactly. You, you, you didn't want, want want that ever to leave. But um, times move on and uh, stadiums now are, are unbelievable. 
you know, just unrecognizable yeah. from, from back then. Yeah, we're, we're quite fortunate, aren't we, in, in this country, because we've got some of the best stadiums in the world, haven't we, really? I mean, there's some obviously some great stadiums around the world, Europe and, and, and other countries, but we have some wonderful stadiums here. Well, Fitting I don't know if we've been Cup. to the new Tottenham Stadium, but... I, I haven't I have personally been. been there, no, I haven't. Well, I've, I've been there as a fan to watch some games as a, as a guest of somebody in the executive mm. areas. And then there was an event there and I went on a tour of the stadium. Um, and, and, and it was just unbelievable. You know, there was a, a, a room, a designated room, which was a cigar room for the executives. Oh, Wonderful. Um, I mean, it was just... Um, and the facilities... Uh, it's just mind-boggling. It's just one. That, it's probably the best stadium in the world, and I've been virtually to every ground. You know, it, it, it was disappointing to go to the old Maracana, mm. where on TV you'd watch so many great Brazilian teams oh, play. Wow, yes. And, and to go there um, when Man United played in the World Club Championships and to see such a ramshackled old derelict building Yes. It was just such a disappointment. Yes, it beggars belief, doesn't it? You have this wonderful picture in your mind and you go there and it's just simply not the stadium you thought it was. No. Uh, it's crazy, really. I have been to the Azteca in Mexico City a couple of times and that's a nice old stadium. Not quite, well, not... I was at the Azteca with uh, Diego Maradona's uh, Hand of God, of course. Oh, of course, yes. yes. So you've been uh, there too. <laughs> Good old ground. And this wonderful goal and uh, privilege to... Uh, I've been one of the few journalists to have actually interviewed him in a relaxed one-to-one -one situation. I can't Very imagine nice. many have done that. No, definitely not. And that's quite an interesting story because um, uh, I loved Ozzy Ardenas from the moment he came to Spurs and mm -hmm. grew to know him very well. And I was on Daily Mirror and I said to Ozzy, look, um, Diego's playing for Spurs in a Spurs shirt for your testimony, Ozzy. This is unbelievable. I've got to, in the mirror, just interview the guy. Yes. Can you please arrange it? And he said, <laughs> yeah, okay, I'll arrange it. Um, Monte Fresco, I don't know whether people remember Monte Fresco, the world's greatest ever football sports journalist, um, photographer of all time. Mm. And Monte was uh, signed by me to turn up uh, at the hotel. We both turned up at Diego's hotel where Ozzy was going to pick him up. And the idea was we did an interview with him and some uh, photographic session, and the, the small senator assigned a back page, a spread inside, another spread inside. It was wow. volumes of space. We turned up, um, and um, I saw Rosie, and how, how are you, Rosie? He says, I'm very worried. And he's pacing up and down outside the hotel. He said, Diego's arrived. Now, Diego hadn't was actually on World Cup duty. Mm. And the manager of the Argentinian team told him, you cannot go and play in a testimonial. We are moving from one country to another to play some World Cup warm-up games, and you have got to stay with the squad. And he told the manager, I gave my word to my friend, Ozzy, and I'm going to play in his testimonial. Wow. So he left the World Cup squad, flew to London, off, immediately after a game, I think it was in Sweden, he was obviously knackered, so he went to the hotel straight to bed. Wow. Took the phone off the hook, <laughs> and they, he was fast asleep. And Ozzy's pacing up and down going, we should now be going off the ground. Where is he? Uh, and I said to him, what about my interview, Ozzy? He said, Ozzy, no chance. No chance. <laughs> no interview. He said, we're going to have to go straight away. So after a couple of hours, and Ozzy was really, really worried. Suddenly, without any introduction, the lift opened and out came Diego Maradona, followed by 50 people. It was like, you know, the, the advert about how many people can you get in a mini? Yes. It was like, how many people can you get in a mini? <laughs> oh, so out came Diego Maradona, his wife, his agent, <laughs> another agent, his masseur, his minders. I mean, it just, they all just spilled out of this lift. Oh, yes, yeah, there we go. Let's do the interview. And I said, you can't do the interview. I said, what about the picture? Okay, one picture. We went round to the side of the hotel. <laughs> Monte Fresco took a picture of me, Ozzy, Diego, and his wife. And then I came back 
And he said, no interview, no time. I said, come on, Ozzy. Look, I get the sack. I've got all these, all these pages to fill. He said, right, I'm driving Diego to White Hart Lane, getting the back. So there's Ozzy driving, Diego in the passenger seat, and me in the back. And off we set. Hours late. You get to White Hart Lane. <laughs> well, a great story. Never try to get to the old White Hart Lane down the Seven oh, Sisters Road. Nightmare. Down the Seven Sisters Road before the game. It's testimonial. Yeah. But thousands were locked out of that game. So it's it's bumper to bumper down the Seven Sisters Road. Mm. So I'm stuck there. I'm doing my interview. I was his translator. <laughs> I've, got, I've got him for in the back of the car. Anyway. Um, people are looking at us going, is that Diego Maradona? <laughs> and go, Can't be. He'd be out on the pitch by now, you know, warming <laughs> yeah. up. But in those days, no mobile. So we got into, into the high road and I said to us, look, you've got to let me out now. I've got to go into the phone box and phone all my story to the mirror, which I did. I then caught the bus, got there for half time and watched the rest of the game. And that was how I got my exclusive interview with Diego Maradona. Oh, what a fantastic story. That's brilliant. And of course, what comes out of that to me is persistence pays off, doesn't it, Harry? If you've got, you want your goal, you can see it there. You just persistently keep it going and going and going until you win. Uh, that's a wonderful story. It really is. I mean, sports journalism has had more than its share of driven individuals, as we were talking about, really. But if you compare with yourself, Harry, which your previous discussions were kind of um, raised really and as a lifelong Tottenham Hotspurs fan you have spent most of your career in and around the old White Hart Lane of course now the new ground too starting as a reporter on the North London Weekly Herald before, as we mentioned before before graduating to become one of, the, one of the country's foremost football journalists and you had the ear of the then Alan Sugar Chairman Alan Sugar during Tottenham's Nadir in the 1990s I mean there simply has to be some great stories here Harry as well stories that simply must be told with the great Alan Sugar <laughs> moments i'm sure you've got to be joking <laughs> <laughs> at least i didn't get you're fired <laughs> yeah exactly i mean he was a character wasn't he you know and i can remember the day oh, he was there yeah, I need sugar. Yeah, well. those songs used to ring around the ground you know a little bit of sugar makes the spurs go down <laughs> you know because he was literally a businessman without any football idea wasn't it it's incredible really do you, th do you think many people know the real island sugar probably not Actually, yeah. to be fair, uh, he and his wife, me and my wife, we spent many hours together at the sure. Dorchester, the Savoy, mm. having drinks, dinner, going to other restaurants. Uh, I don't think many people know him as well as I do. Maybe Nick Hewer does. Yeah. Uh, maybe one or two of his advisors do. But um, uh, I love the guy. Yeah. <laughs> He's just different class. He, he is so outwardly gruff and difficult, you would think, to get on with. But inside is just such a big softy i'm sure he is yeah he, he no it, but he is trust me oh, he, I do. He, and and all this about whether he had spurs at heart he did have spurs at heart mm -hmm. um, and he wanted them to succeed he thought terry venables and he were the dream team until i really uh, you know showed him otherwise well or he showed me otherwise mm -hmm. you know um but um, what would you like to know about him? <laughs> I don't. No, not really. I mean, I just mentioned Alan Sugar because he is a character, and of course, the "You're Fired" is always very inspirational. He'll be remembered for that for all of his life, I imagine. Um, but you know, you the only, story. The only thing I can tell you is, yeah, he did, he did contact me, and and uh, it's, it's probably why he doesn't know me anymore. He did say, <laughs> "Look, I'm doing a, a new program called The Apprentice, mm. and the idea is blah 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 blah." And I said, "Oh, that never take off." <laughs> it certainly did. Oh, it took off big time, didn't it? So, yeah. yeah. Perhaps I shouldn't tell you that because... I mean, no, but it's anyway. a great story, isn't it? I mean, be honest and tell the stories as they are. It's fantastic. I mean, as the multiple award-winning football writer, uh, your byline has appeared on the London Even News, Daily Mail, Daily Mirror, Daily and Sunday Express, the Daily Star and Star on Sunday back pages. I mean, it's an amazing career, Harry, isn't it? I mean, what editorial, though, out of all of those, did you prefer to write for? Or you, just, you just wrote the same stories for all? I mean, how did you... Manager. Well, even now, I, I'm stopped in the street and people still think I write for the Daily Mirror. I mean, mm. I, I was there 
writing for them for 20 years. Yes. Um, but obviously nearly 10 with the Express and four or five years with the Daily Mails. But um, people still associate me with the Daily Mirror and I still get comments to this day. They enjoyed my writing in the Daily Mirror. People associate me with the Daily Mirror. It's just a shame that the Daily Mirror don't associate themselves with me anymore because it's not the Daily mm. Mirror, it's Reach. Different owners, different yes. editors, yeah. sub-editors. Um, you'd have to ask them why why they don't um, really reach out to me up reach. But you know, um, Sean Custis, who's my uh, sports editor on the Express, he, uh, we have a regular dialogue, and I, I I do all my extracts of my books with him mm. because he's someone I've worked with and I trust. So um, we work very well together. That's fantastic. I was in my local pub actually uh, the other night, and I mentioned to my local publican, uh, a chap called Johnny George. Um, and he, I said, oh, I've got Harry Harris on my show the, uh, on Thursday. Oh, I love Harry Harris. I still love reading his sports articles. So it's nice to hear that, isn't it? It's wonderful. Well, it's nice to hear someone loves me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you've got loads of uh, fans out there with your editorial. I'm sure mm. you have. I mean, you also appeared on on all the major TV uh, news and sports channels, Harry, which include, include actually Richard and Judy, for example, Newsnight, BBC News, ITN News at 10, Sky, and of course, Satanta as well. Plus, you've been interviewed on Football Focus, appeared on the original Hold the Back page, and Jimmy Hill's Sunday Supplement on Sky TV. What a programme that was. Not forgetting regular radio s- slots, of course, or Radio 5 Live, Radio 4, and Talk Sports. So, you could say you're you are a true all rounder when it comes to media coverage, Harry, couldn't you? Really, you've you've done it all. Well, I mean, you probably know yourself. I've been on uh, GB News twice this week. You have probably beyond another once or twice. Uh, talking about a football regulator, talking about mm. gay footballers. You know, they, yes. they, uh, I'm on regularly on GB News, and delighted to be so. You know, they 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 want to know my opinion on a wide range of subjects. Yes, which cross over from news and sports. So. Still going strong there. I've written 90 books, as you know. I've got uh, one one or two coming out, maybe three this year. We'll talk about those later in the show. I mean, you really are. Well, hopefully. hopefully. <laughs> yes, we will. Absolutely going to do that. Um, so you are. You're, you're kind of an icon, really, with, within sports writing, aren't you, really, in journalism, media work around the game, really are. You know, some might say you're somewhat the oracle, even. So that's a great accolade to have. I mean, you won 24 industry awards over a 40-year career in newspapers. Your accolades include the SJA Scoop of the Year, and I know you had many scoops, award for breaking the news of Roy Keane leaving the Republic of Ireland's 2002 World Cup squad. I mean, what a story. So please tell us more about that scoop, Harry, the uh, Roy Keane one. And, of course, what other uh, major scoops did you find and report on too? Let's have a bit of a scoop discussion. Well, yeah. Well, um, I'm probably the only football journalist to have won Scoop of the Year mm. twice. Yes. Um, but, you know, it really wrangles with me. I didn't get the hat trick because there was one or two stories, yeah. you know, breaking the story about Paul Merson taking drugs and uh, his alcoholism yeah. and, and advising him to come clean and, and, and admitting it and confessing to it, which I, I told him would save his club and, and club and, yes. and international career, which which he did. And which it which it did work for him, um, uh, and breaking that story we've talked about Alan Sugar, Terry Venables, yeah. and all that sort of stuff. You know, many people have said, "Well, how could that not possibly have won the uh, scoop of the year award?" But there was a lot at that time mm. people who were friends of Terry Venables, of course, uh, yeah. and, and, and judging and on the committees and all that sort of stuff. It was very political. Um, so uh, the ones that got away are the ones that um, I think of more than the ones that uh, I actually got the awards for. Yeah, sad, isn't it, really? But you know, that's life, I suppose, in some ways, too. There are other people doing other scoops. You can't be the only person winning them. And uh, uh, But that would have been a great story. That would, and we'll come on to just a little bit about that in a moment. So I've got that listed here uh, as to what happened at Spurs uh, in those days. But before that, in your desire to chase a story, Harry, and it's great to chase a story, um, you know, I'm, I kind of like that myself in a way as well. You have raced a former Spurs boss around the White Hart Lane cinder track. I mean, this is fantastic. I mean, what a fan, uh, fascinating and somewhat unique experience that must have been. And why? Why race? Um, a Spurs boss around the White Hart Lane cinder track. Now you're talking about this new book there, aren't you? 
Well, <laughs> sort of, yes. You've seen this on the back cover of the book. <laughs> I've done my research, Harry. You, see, you have. Though. I'm very impressed. Yes. Uh, why race Terry Finnegan around the track? Well, look. Uh, football journalism back then was a different kettle of fish than it is now. It was personal. Yeah. Now, now it's remote. It's all, it's all this garbage you see on, on, on social oh. media. It's journalists guessing. Yes. It's having a, you know, a, a little stab at things. And, you know, I call it a dartboard sy- syndrome. You throw yeah. enough darts at the gar- uh, dartboard, you might actually hit double double top. Yes. Um, but in those days, it was personal. So, I would go to White Hart Lane to see the managers. And Terry Venables was the manager. Uh, it was the summer. It was pre-season. And, uh, you know, I, I played football and uh, thought I was fit. And um, and um, Terry was sort of like um, still in his prime, very young man. Yes, he was. And um, I don't know what possessed me. I said, why don't we have a little race around the track? <laughs> <laughs> and he accepted. We did, but you know, we we started off, and it was it's a long track. It's a big big track when you're actually running against someone who is as fit as the uh, as, as Terry Neal was, was at that time. But of course, you know, I wasn't bad at sprinting, so we took off, and I was quite well ahead going round the first bend. But you know, it's a marathon, not a sprint, and he caught up and overtook me. So unfortunately, at the end, it looks as though I was way behind. But he was very worried for most of that race. A good race and a good experience and a good story to tell, isn't it? Let's be honest. Uh, they're the sort of things that don't happen in today's games now. Uh, the no. sports. There's, not, there's no chance of uh, chasing Pep Guardiola around the track. No. Man City. I don't think so. That's never going to happen, <laughs> is it, in a month or Sundays, <laughs> sadly. Yeah. I mean, you also helped, and we're coming on to this now, in the dismissal of another Spurs boss following a, a Daily Mirror exclusive. You know, fantastic. Like these exclu- exclusives and these scoops. Firstly, who was the Spurs boss? I think we can work it out. Well, you know who it is. And secondly, how did the exclusive come about, Harry? I mean, tell us the the background for all of this. Well, you're talking about George Graham, aren't you? Yes, I am. Yeah, I thought you might be. (laughs) Well, um, I I was actually sitting in in the press box in Monte Carlo covering a Super Super Cup game. Mm. Uh, I think Chelsea were playing in that game. Um, And um, I rang Alan Sugar to find out the latest position of his uh, managerial search and who he was appointing. And I knew that uh, George Graham was in the frame among two or three others. And, and I think, I don't know whether you recall, but the Spurs fans at the time, which I think we don't want George Graham. <laughs> yes. uh, but whatever it was, you know, what Alan Sugar said to me was, look, I've appointed managers in the past. They haven't worked. So I've got some experts, I've got ex- some experts players, I've got some people who you, you would trust within the industry. So I'm asking their opinion. And they told me George Graham was the best in the business at the time. Hard to argue with that because, oh, very. you know, very hard to argue after what he'd done at Arsenal. I just said to him, you know, Spurs fans aren't going to take to an ex-Arsenal boss, they're not. ex-Arsenal player of that degree. We don't enough with Terry Neal. And they're not going to take to him. It's going to end in grief. I'm telling you, Alan, it might look good, might taste good, but it won't. Yeah, it's going to give you indigestion. Yes. Um, and he and he gave me the usual answer. Bugger off! I know what I'm doing. I've got all these experts <laughs> on the board. I'm appointing George Graham. I said, no, no, no worries. I filed the story from Monte Carlo, covering something completely different. George Graham will be the new manager. Fine. Wasn't long before George Graham was creating a kind of Terry Venables syndrome of waves. I'm not getting the players I want. I'm not getting the finance I want. That's why I'm not as successful as I want to be. Um, and um, the the Spurs vice chairman at the time uh, wasn't very impressed by this. And, and in fact, uh, eventually, I, I got the impression that something was going on. And I, I got uh, in touch with the guy and he said, look, I've, I've spoken to George Graham. I don't accept what he's saying mm. and we're not, we're going to get rid of him. So I was able to break that story as well. Good story. And I expect um, a lot of Spurs fans were happy with that, I guess, you know. United. <laughs> oh, absolutely. The hatred between Arsenal and Spurs is, is, is uh, well, deep, isn't it? Yeah. Never heal. that will always be there. I think Come Sunday, fair. we will see even more so. Oh, it? yeah, of course. It's a North London derby again. Wow, cracking. What a match that will be. I think it's fair to say you can count many 
who have occupied the Spurs hot seat among your closest friends, as you, as you indeed you've intimated early on in the show, you know, in the game, from Bill Nicholson through to Jose Mourinho, of course, you have met them all. Um, you know, what about Jose? He was an inspirational manager, wasn't he? Did did it all at Chelsea. Um, not really doing too much at the moment. Dad, what did you think of Jose? I thought I think he was an inspiring character myself, I have to say. Well, I've written five books about Jose Mourinho. Yeah, and I I've done that unless I thought it was an inspiring exactly. character. I think I, I, when I first started writing about him um, in the in the books as well as like, about the stories about him, yes. I described him like um, Brian Clough on speed. <laughs> you know, it was like um, it, it, here's just an unbelievable character that's capable of anything. And, and I didn't realise how much he was capable of, but we've seen, I've seen recent clips of Brian Clough and it reminded me when when fans invaded the pitch, which... Um, really, Brian Clough did not like, and he actually went on the pitch and thumped two of them. Do you remember that? I do he remember that. Yes, yeah. And and Jose Mourinho wasn't wasn't uh, adverse to poking a coach in the eye at Real Madrid, was he? So, no, he wasn't. Similar character. Um, yeah, but it, it just illustrates how fiery he was, how <laughs> passionate this guy is. Yeah. But um, you know, behind the scenes, he's just so much. A family man, so much in, intent about his family. The first person he would read when he wins a major trophy is his wife. Yeah, that's a great story. Um, I mean, you know how much he, 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 you know, he involves his daughter in what he's ever he's doing. Um, he, he is a very complex character and well worthy of the four books, I think. Oh, without doubt, without doubt. And I'm sure that um, you know I will probably get around to reading them actually, Harry, because I'm sure they're cracking stories. Jose Mourinho actually is a is a is a individual as a coach as a manager. I'd like on this show at some point maybe be able to help me get him on because he he would make a great show. Jose Mourinho he really would. Absolutely fascinating character. Um, really got a lot of time for Jose. Uh, long may he continue in doing what he does. Quite simple, isn't it? Really, sure he will. And then yes. you know he's not going to change much. No, he won't. <laughs> no, <laughs> he's born the way he is, and that's it. Fantastic. Mm, what is an individual? Back. Isn't he it? came back a second time to Chelsea saying he was a changed man, but you know, I didn't wasn't. believe it. And I don't think anybody else did. No, I certainly didn't, you know, because the old, the old saying, a leopard doesn't change its, you know, spots and things like that. Uh, no way was Jose Mourinho going to change. He was, no. he, he is who he is uh, and a very interesting character and a great, great coach as well. And here's my thought. Yes. Could any manager ever come back to a club for a third time? <laughs> well, that's a good thought, isn't it? Um, if they've been there twice before, the chances of a third, uh, a third, a third trip back to a club is got to be limited, isn't it? Really, I think with Jose Mourinho though, to go back to Chelsea a third time is a possibility. The reason why I say that he's actually loved at the club by everybody that knew him. The supporters um, would would welcome him back with open arms. I think the majority of them. So you know that would be. So I pose that question for you. Yeah. Would a manager ever come back for a third time? I so think if ever, ever anyone could, it would be him. It would be him. And I think Jose Mourinho would say yes to it as well if the conditions were right. Oh, he'd be welcome. He has a move. He still, he still lives in West London. He does. He loves it. He loves Chelsea. He does. And to have him back at the Stanford Bridge, who knows? That would be, that would be a great, Fans great. Him. They do. He's, 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 a, he's a god at Chelsea. And um, to have him back there, Stanford Bridge, you know, is a logical thing to happen. So if they when think of changing the current manager, mm. we've seen all the candidates they've put forward. Yeah. None of them would, would satisfy anyone other than the guy we're talking about. Indeed. Jose's the man, as they say. So well, let's see what happens in the summer, end of the season. You never know. Anything can happen in football. <laughs> and it usually does. Then in 2020, you joined Phil and Nick on the BBC Sport London to look back on the 1990 World Cup. You talked about Gaza's tears. We've mentioned earlier on, of course, about uh, Diego Maradona. Um, the penalty misses and David Platt's last dick winner against Belgium. Oh, do I remember that? What a lot of fun that show must have been because that 1990 World Cup was, was something, wasn't it? It had everything for everybody to um, dislike and enjoy at the same time. It was full of it, wasn't it, really? Well, I wrote a recent book about it. And then what yeah. I did is I interviewed every player that was in the England squad Indeed. To talk about their dressing room experiences um, and how fascinating that turned out to be. You know, it was a great insight to football at that time, that era. 
you, know, you couldn't replicate it now. It doesn't, not possible. It's just no. so, changed so much. But um, what went on behind the scenes was just incredible. Yes, and of yeah, course, I, I was that. there, and I, and I experienced most of it. It was one of the most um, gratifying experiences of my life. Yeah, um, well, I did hear a story about Gascoigne or Gaza coming out one day. All the England players around a pool, and he went up to the diving board, dressed up or in a in some kind of outfit, and launched himself off the top of the diving board, come out of the pool, and walked back inside or gather to get a drink. I mean, he was crazy, wasn't he, Paul Gascoigne? But what what a what a character he he was, really. Funny, full of well, fun. I've, I've, I've probably uh, one of the few people have known him for as long as I have done. You know, it's mm. uh, but, uh, and it's just exploit after for exploit. You know, everyone's got their favourite Gascoigne story. And I have. Uh, I've just written a book now, which you're going to come to, and and someone's talking about their favourite Gascoigne story that I've never heard. Mm. Uh, there is always a new one. There is, there is indeed. a new one in my new book. <laughs> well, so what in that book is called? So let the let the let the uh, listeners know so they can go out and grab it. What's the book called? Well, it, it's um, a, a book I've, I've written with Paul Trevelyan. Yes, and it's a book that is in kind of like an art form. Oh, uh, we're coming on to that. Yeah, it's a unique kind of concept. Yeah, we'll so come on to that shortly. Till you come on to that, then, yeah, we'll come on to that shortly. I thought perhaps it might have been another book, but that's fine. Yeah, that's the I one. mean, who did you admire amongst your contemporaries as well, Harry? You know, and who gave you the inspiration as a sports writer? Who it must have been someone behind you, I guess, that was inspiring you to write or to be great in the game, really, as a as a sports journalist. So who did you admire as your contemporaries? Well, uh, you probably don't remember him, but Vic Roughton, the oh, okay. uh, evening news, you know, uh, he, he he was a legend. At his time, and he took me under his wing, and he showed me a few little tricks of the trade. Um, but the, the inspiration was really the football itself. Mm. You know, the, um, the the desire to find out more about it, and the more you go behind the scenes, the more fascinating it becomes. So, was there anybody doing that kind of thing at that time? I don't think there was. You know, mm. um, football was more about the game it was about the match report it was about the follow-ups quotes the comments it wasn't very much about the investigation about what people were up to mm. so it was a kind of niche thing that I, I took up which w was good at the time but now everyone's into that kind of thing they are everyone but at least uh, there is more of it you know you, you you have these kind of like internet people who are dishing out all, all kinds of documents that can prove all sorts of things. At that time, uh, I was a lone voice mm. um, with, with lone documents. And, and to be perfectly blunt, the media, my colleagues, rival papers, detested that kind of thing. They thought I was out of order by uh, looking into people that we all considered to be, they weren't quite friends, but people who were friendly. Mm. But they were friendly towards the media for that particular reason. You know, keep keep your enemies on side. You know, keep them close to you. Always keep your enemies close to you. Absolutely, it's a very true statement. And then there have been the books. Now we must get this is a wonderful part of your life. And we're about uh, we'll talk about some of your wonderful books that you've written previously in a moment. But first, and it's important to say, you haven't finished yet. And with writing still very much your honoured craft and delicacies of the written word, you are now writing and producing a new and unique book in collab collaboration with the genius artist, of course, Paul Trevelyan, who himself was on the show just a few weeks ago. Can you please tell us all about this fantastic new project? Wonderful. <laughs> Uh, I don't know whether the new generation know Paul Trevelyan as well as they should do, but they should do because he's such a genius. You know, he, he is. You know, his his um, uh, his graphics, his his drawings, his oh. artwork of of, of um, sports, and particularly football, as we're talking about now in this book. You know, he's the master of motion, so it's not just a, a, a two dimensional. He, he has the ability to produce this artwork that looks three dimensional. Um, so. Putting the two of us together, and of course he's a great Spurs fan as I am. Yes, I don't, you know, um, I don't know. It's about 150 years between us supporting Spurs. <laughs> it's just incredible. 
but um, it's full of his drawings, uh, his, his memorabilia, um, uh, you know, personal photographs with, with, with all the people that we're writing about. It, it is really a unique um, book that uh, we're, we're producing as a limited edition. And mm. I, whatever the publishers are charging for each edition, um, it's going to be worth 10 times as much. Incredible. Because it, it, it really is something special. Yeah, and I'm looking forward to it because I know you're very um, in with this this book at the moment, obviously with Paul, and you know, you're, you're really excited about its release. And, you know, it was once said, and I, I talked about it with Paul on the show here a few weeks ago, that a graphic artist at Disney uh, once said that what Paul captures in one drawing would take the best of us, the rest of us, about 24 drawings to complete. Uh, so that sort of says anything about how how great Paul uh, Trevelyan is as an artist and with yourself as well as uh, the renowned, you know, uh, journalist that you are, Harry, the both of you together, both good friends and both Tottenham supporters. I mean, it's a great project, isn't it? Working on that together. It's got to well, be a lot of fun. It's been a joy to do it. I mean, oh. it's, it's just, uh, uh, and it, it's a history of Spurs through Paul's art. He, he comes back to Rory right. Churchill. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they certainly drawn Spurs, legends from the 50s um but you know it, it, it's a personal history mm. these personal stories about meeting these players and talking to them and and how he got the insight to draw them wow uh, of course my in, in, insight into all these characters that we've been talking about bill nicholson and many others of course so it, it, it is a history that you've never read before and when is this book going to be published? When's it out this year? Obviously, later on this year. How do how do people get to buy it? How do well? It is an exclusive for you. It's oh, available okay. as of today. Wow! There we are, <laughs> as of today, folks. Twenty fifth of April, twenty twenty four. You can now purchase this amazing book by Harry Harris and the quite genius, of course, Paul Trevelyan. Well, the actual purchase. publication date is June the twelfth, and the the, the, the uh, former Spurs vice chairman. Uh, has offices in Mayfair, and we're go we're going there with us, with some Spurs legends. Okay. And Paul is 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 handing over some of his artwork to them personally, and signed. Um, that's the official publication day, but it's now being actually printed in Turkey as we speak, and Fantastic. it will be arriving back in England next week. And on the uh, publisher's website, you can purchase it. But that's Fantastic. the only way you can. Brilliant. It, it, you know, it's a limited edition. Um, uh, uh, it's uh, twenty five pounds signed copies, mm. but um, signed copies. I think you'd end up putting them on eBay for ten times the amount. Yeah, without doubt. Sounds like it's going to be a bestseller. And say limited edition. Get out and buy a book now. That's that's my advice. Because if you um, can, if there's if any, you can. yeah. Yep, yeah, or snap a one if you can from somewhere. So uh, you know, <laughs> it's got it's got to be done, hasn't it? It's a fantastic book in the making. It really oh, yeah. is. It's not on Amazon yet. I mean, eventually, you know, it will be um, uh, probably the paperback edition, mm. uh, but the the hardback is is, is a limited edition print, mm -hmm. and um, no one really knows that. But um, I can tell you that there are now dozens already sold, and there won't be many left. No, absolutely, success. Success indeed in the hardback. Congratulations. That'd be a fantastic story, fantastic book to read. You have won almost as many awards, Sir Harry, as Sir Alex Ferguson has won trophies. In fact, you have actually written more books than Sir Alex for, uh, has uh, has won silverware. Many journalists turn to book writing as a, well, not always lucrative sideline, and no one can compare, surely, with your prolific self, uh, Harry. So let's dig a little deeper. You have been the author of no fewer than 80 football-related books, including autobiography, collaborations, biographies, and official club annuals. You have written with or about a diverse collection of players and managers, including George Best, Glenn Hoddle, Jurgen Klinsmann, Gianluca Vialli, God bless him, Jose Mourinho, Rude Hullet, Paul Merson, Gary Mabbitt, of course, Steve McMahon, Terry Neal, Bill Nicholson, and, of course, Pelle. The, the list is endless. Some big names there, Harry, isn't there? Really? So please enlighten us more here. Who was your favourite interview with and why? It's the first question. Well, it's, I'm sorry to say, but it's got to be Pele. Yeah, I, thought, I knew you were going to say it's that. It's got to be Pele. What a gentleman it, uh, he was. It's, um, you know, 
It was funny because I was uh, at La Manga having a little brief holiday and uh, I'm reading a book about Brazilian football and there wasn't very much about Pelé. I rang my literary agent and I just said, there, there must be a, you know, a library of Pelé books, mm. but I'd love to write a book about Pelé. And he said, of course there'd be a library of Pelé books. Anyway, he rang me the next day and said, there's one Pelé book. It was written in Portuguese in 1979. Uh, not very good but with the translation and that is it. Wow. So I said, well, I'm not going to write one unless he endorses it. So the next time I saw him, I've seen him many times, I just said to him, and he was actually having a little bit of a dip at that time. He was being ostracized by FIFA. Mm. He had some political aspirations. He he wasn't at at his peak um, in terms of global football. Um, And I just said to him, look, I want to write your life story. And he looked at me and he got up, so I got up. And, and he gave me a great big hug. And he said, I can't believe anyone wants to write my life story. Really? That's unbelievable, isn't it? And um, obviously we met up many times around the world. Yeah. Uh, and I interviewed him many times about the book. I sent him the book and he sent me back some corrections. And, um, you know, it, it's such an honour and privilege. I wouldn't say I'm his official biographer, but many people would assume that mm. given those circumstances, that's his official biography. Indeed. Written by no other than Harry Harris. What a fantastic car- character Pele was. It really was. I mean, as a club reporter at Tottenham Hotspur, you met legendary Tottenham boss, as we've mentioned earlier, Bill Nicholson, forming a friendship that would, would lead you to write the Yorkshireman's autobiography after his retirement. And of course, he didn't want to write it, as you said earlier in the show. I mean, tell us a little bit more about your friendship with Bill Nicholson, because it's obviously quite a deep one. Um, well, we just got on, you know, yeah. he, 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 he just kind of like took this junior journalist under his wing. It was just incredible. But back in those days, you know, I, I, I would go to the training ground and I, I, I sit behind the goal and I chat to a couple of the players who weren't playing in the training session or were injured. You, you had so much greater access. You'd go down to the canteen, get a cup of tea mm-hmm. and talk to the players. You had, you had great, more freedom. Um, you travel with the players. You stay in the same hotel, travel on the plane, uh, see them on the, on the carousel collecting their luggage and talk to them. You get to know them. Um, I don't think anyone knows anyone these days. You know, they're all super multi-billionaires and superstars that don't want to know the media. They don't need the media. They've got social media. They've got their multitude of agents and other outlets. They don't need to project themselves through the media. They don't need to give any interviews to the media. They, you know, they can put it on social media and, and put their point of view there. They certainly can. That's the way it is now in the modern day, isn't it? That's how it's worked out now, sadly. But so uh, I really enjoyed what, what what occurred then, what happened then was something special to actually get to know these people. So I got to know Bill. Um, it was funny the way he, you know, he told me in great detail why, why he quit. Mm. Um, and that was all in his book eventually, but I think it was very sad the way he was treated by the board. You know, they asked him to stay on to help him with the appointment. Then he stayed on to help with the transition rather than having these temporary managers. Mm. Uh, but then they didn't actually ask his opinion. You know, he wanted to get Johnny Giles in, Terry Butcher in, um, to make some important signings and get, you know, get some right people in. And they appointed Terry Neal. <laughs> Unbelievable, isn't it? And I and I, and I bumped into um, poor old dear old Sydney Whale, the chairman in the car park, mm. uh, a week after the appointment of Terry Neal, and, and just he, he just caught him there. And as the you know, local journalist, just interview him about his appointment, and then I, we were chatting away, and I said, "Did you know he played for Arsenal and managed Arsenal? He was an Arsenal man." No, he said. Blimey, was he? <laughs> <laughs> Funny story, isn't it? It's great to hear people's reactions oh, dear, like that. Oh dear, you couldn't make that up. Could you? you couldn't make it up. It's a great, another great story. It's funny, <laughs> isn't it? And of course, getting back to Pele, and in 2018, an updated edition of Pele, His Life and Times, was published to coincide with the 2018 World Cup. While in the same year, an updated version of your highly successful Down Memory Lane, a Spurs fan's view yeah. of the last 50 years, was also published. I mean, they're two great books. That's inspirational in 2018, isn't it, Harry? 
Well, the publishers never cease to amaze me by wanting to keep updating these books. So, um, you know, it's not a question of writing new ones. I spend half the time updating the old ones. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, fine, you know, fine by me. You know, um, uh, I mentioned, you mentioned 80, but I'm up to 90 now. Well, you can't put that pen down, can you? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> well, my research works slightly out of date by 10 mm. books, but there you go. You probably well, wrote them last in night. 10 minutes' time as well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's great. You know, you're you're uh, you're a worthy writer. You know, and uh, the fact that you're still doing it is, is brilliant. And keep going, keep going with the books, Harry, because that's great. Well, you know, people don't realise this, but you know, um, I, I'm still writing for the papers because I mentioned I'm still doing yeah. stuff for the Sun. I do stuff for the Times. I work with the Telegraph. Um, um, ben Rumsey called me in a couple of years ago to help him with some investigations. I helped him with the investigation on the Emiliano Sala yep. um, crash. And I've written um, a book about that as a consequence, and that's been updated two or three times. I'm now in, in the progress of writing a three-part um, drama Whoa. about it. Fantastic. And this isn't about football. It's about true crime. And there's a couple of uh, broadcasters desperate to um, get their hands on this. Wonderful. Um, we've interviewed um, the Cardiff City owner, Vincent Tan. He doesn't give many interviews, and it's an extensive interview about what happened, about his life at Cardiff. It's a fascinating interview with him. Uh, also an interview with the club chairman. And we're interviewing very very many other people involved in it. But this is, I mean, you, you can guess what you, you can guess by where I'm coming from, but the title is, it's called The Killing of Emiliano Sala. Yeah. And that, that was a sad you know, story. That word has been produced with a great deal of thought. This wasn't an accident. No, and I think actually, I think everybody does realise that now. And uh, you know, and it's an extremely sad story that really is. You've got to feel for you know his his family and Cardiff City at the time. I mean, yeah. dreadful... so I'm working on that film, but that's not the first. I've done four other. I've produced four other films. Mm. Uh, I'm in, in numerous documentaries. Uh, I'm now the sports uh, uh, development director at SmartFrame. Nice. Proves you're never too old in, to be in new technology. Absolutely. I'm in new, I'm in new tech. Come on. I mean, new tech, it must be funny, surely. That's well, well, it? well, certainly is. <laughs> yeah, well, we'd I'm all use tech. it. <laughs> you know? We all use it as media individuals, you know, no, on it all the is, time. But this isn't just new tech. This is no. revolutionising photography, the photographic image. It's taken out the dark ages. It's taken away from people who've been exploiting uh, clubs, yeah. players, and, and even the fans exploiting their images. There's three billion images a day on the internet. Mm. Two point eight billion of them are stolen. Yes, of course they are. Sad so, story. You can't steal them with smart frame. It has authenticity status. Mm -hmm. So you can't fake it with AI and you can't uh, distort it. And within the image, you can reduce advertising. Nice. Sounds like an interesting technology, which I'm sure Paul Trevelyan is, is uh, very good at using as well. With all this wonderful work he does. I'm not sure at the age of 90 he's in the <laughs> I I'm, just a, I'm just a youngster. Yeah, of course you are. <laughs> I said that with tongue-in-cheek, actually, to be honest. But <laughs> I'm sure Paul would like to know about it. I'm sure he does know about it. But, yeah, wonderful stuff. Oh, and in addition, you've also written All the Way Jose or Jose, Chelsea Century, and a number of Manchester United's books. And so not just Spurs books, Harry, either. Do you, you have gone across the board with other clubs? Oh, no, no, no. no it's just not Spurs. I've written about... Uh, Leicester City winning the Premier League, Leicester oh, City have. winning the FA Cup. Yes. Uh, I've even written Arsenal books. Now, uh, you know, that, that takes some um, credit, doesn't it? So it I've certainly written, does. Paul Merson's story, uh, yeah. Terry Neal's book. I've been um, annuals about Arsenal. You know, you, 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 as a journalist, you're supposed to be unbiased. So You are. You're a professional. You, you can't yeah. lose those opportunities either. Deadly Doug on yeah. Aston Villa. Wonderful. I've written Newcastle book when we went up to Newcastle. Um, so uh, the Cardiff City books that we talked about. Yeah, indeed. So it's definitely just not Spurs books. And that's great I've to hear. Numerous Man United books. You have, yeah. So I've noticed that actually when I was doing the research work. L quite Liverpool a few. books. Yeah. Brilliant. You're known all over the world as a sports editor, writer, 
across the football world, aren't you really? It's a big name, Harry Harris. It really is. A wonderful name. You're also the uh, last journalist. This is a nice story, but sad at the same time, of course. You're also the last journalist to interview George Best for his final book, Hard Tackles and Dirty Barbs. Now, that must have been some interview, Harry, the great George Best. That some people would still say he was the best player in the world. And one of the top players, wasn't he? Definitely. You could put him alongside Pelé and Maradona. Well, <laughs> How could you not? I mean, uh, you know, and I was privileged to go to his memorial service in Belfast, mm. uh, invited by the family. Um, yes, I, I wrote his last book, so I was the last journalist to interview him. Um, but it was a ra rather strange series of interviews because um, he, he, he was commissioned to write this book about... Um, the games he played in, the managers and the players, you know, in the seventies and eighties, uh, and of course he, he had no recollection of it. Very vague, anyway. <laughs> oh, so I spent most of his time talking about his um, escapades with his girlfriends and his <laughs> the, the husbands that were chasing him. <laughs> and all this sort of stuff. Uh, it was fascinating, you know, and I went to see him at one of his rehab places that he was staying at and uh, but we we spent hours talking about football but mm. mostly about the, the the current man united situation although a few years back r rather than the past and he just said look harry you can do all the research for me i'm sure so i did <laughs> that's fascinating what a great uh what a great story um yeah sad story as well isn't it with george best to be honest he never got to see that book no, and that's even that's that's even more sad, isn't it? Really? No, and of course the the they had a writer, a publisher, to do yes. the theology. Uh, it was three books he was doing. One was his autobiography. One was an anecdotal book, and then they had the third. And you know what they really wanted to do, but this yeah. was about all the games, etc., which he, he he had very vague recollection about. <laughs> but they had a particular writer who was doing the three, and they were paying him, even at that time, an absolute fortune. But they didn't want me to write it. But George came came to see me. We were at an event for Alan Hudson, who was publicising his book. He sat next to me. His agent was there. And he said, Harry, look, I need your help. I want you to write this last book. I can't stand this author anymore. He's driving me mad. <laughs> I can't do it. Would you do it for me? I said, George, I'll do anything for you. Yeah, I'll do it. We went to see the publisher. And I, and, and I knew how much they were paying this other author. And then I said, Pay me the same. It's fine. I mean, I'm not asking for more or less. He said, no, we don't want you to write the book. He's, 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 he's contracted to write the book. And George said, you know, contracted or not, I'm not doing it. So they offered me a fifth of the fee. Don't get me wrong. Back in those days, it was still a big fee. Oh, yeah. A fifth. And it was, it was kind of like an insult. Mm -hmm. So I said to George, look, you know, it's not really the money. Uh, I want to write your book. Because of who, because I enjoy your football as most millions do, but Absolutely. I particularly want to write it. And I usually, all these books you're talking about usually come from me, not people coming to me to commission me. Yeah, the books I want to write. So I said, I'll tell you what I do: get the fee, give me your signed shirt, and I'll do it. And he did. Wonderful story. Yeah, you had an impression on everybody, it seems, uh, over the years, haven't you, Harry? And the great George Best. <laughs> Currently, so I'm not sure he's all good, but there you go. Well, that, no, no, nobody's all good, are they? Let's be honest. So there's always a bad story or but two. What really but... got me, what really got me was that because it was George Best's book, he, you know, he had uh, the royalties. I yes. didn't. I yes. was just given a flat rate fee. Yeah. So George died, hadn't seen the book, and the agent said, bring me up. He said, look, Harry, we've got a problem. George Best has died bankrupt. Mm. He can't pay his hospital fees. Oh, dear, oh dear. So, look, if you promote the book and we can sell the book, he's got a series of already agreed, signed up promotional work to do. Would you do some of it? And I said, sure. And there's no fee for me because I'm not getting the royalty on the book. No. So I, the first one I did was Sky. I did a massive interview. It must have been like half an hour, maybe an hour. Mm. Talking about George Best's life, talking about the book, et cetera, et cetera. And some real arsehole on the Daily Mail decided to write in his column that I was profiteering by George Best's death. Oh, dear, dear. 
Where do these people live? Where, where, where do they come from, these people? It's real under gutter. Some, under some rock. Yeah, absolutely. It's gutter. It's terrible. Why not ask me? Why exactly. not ask the publisher? Why not ask his agent? Why not check your facts? No, no. Doesn't like me particularly. Yeah. Just put it in the paper. Anyway, I sue them. Quite and right, too. Up. And they paid up. Good for you, Harry. Good for you. Well but, done. You know, it's the kind of journalism that is really gutter to me. Gutter press. You know, it's terrible. And uh, as you said earlier on, there's more of those stories around these days, you know, fake news stories that's just made up. I'll tell you who it was. You know. Des Kelly. Oh, really? Uh, shame on Des Kelly. That's all I can say. Well, shame on him. And it's not the only thing that um, Des Kelly has done they should be ashamed of. I know much more about that. Mm. Well, but there's, a, there's a lot of these type of people that uh, gravitate to journalism. You know, they do. Uh, we meet them quite often in life too, don't we? So they are around, sadly. But that's part of life and we have to live with it. Indeed. Uh, and in, case, in your case, sadly, you, you uh, had to put up with a story that wasn't true and uh, f- thankfully you had the insight to go out and, and win, the, win the case. Yeah, it's so hurtful. Yeah, it is hurtful. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure it probably still hurts you now because it, it doesn't it doesn't ever, well, ever evaporate. Well, obviously, because I, w- I wouldn't mention it. You know, no, it indeed, just, yeah. These type of lies, you know. Oh. It's just, you know, simply check your facts. There's so many people right. you could have just checked that with. Yeah. He was just after a quick, cheap scoop, wasn't he? Um, you know, and uh, get it printed. And, of course, it all went pear-shaped for him, which is, which is the right thing. That's good. Indeed. Also, not forgetting the books you've written that include, and I've got to bring this up, The History of the Wags. <laughs> from oh, the humble, I from wish the hum- you hadn't. <laughs> oh, no, it's a great thing, isn't it? <laughs> from the humble marriage of England Captain Billy Wright, great story, to one of the Beverly sisters, well, that's a nice story too, to the glamour of Bobby and Tina Moore, wow, and the rise of Posh and Bex as well. I mean, there seems to be no end to your talent, Harry, does there really? Well, it shows I've got a sense of humour. It does. <laughs> and you do have a sense of humour too. Absolutely right, which is coming out in this show. Uh, but it, it's just a, 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 a ever, 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 never-ending list of wonderful um, pieces that you've been involved with, written, articulated, um, as a great journalist and media man that you are. It's, it's brilliant. So congratulations. So what else is on the radar moving forwards? Have you got anything else apart from the Paul Trevelyan piece, of course, that we're, we've talked about earlier on in yourself? Well, it's, it's, it's been so much so much joy in doing it. So much mm. pleasure seeing this develop into, into this art form. Yes. We're now doing um, the same title, but for Chelsea. Yeah. And we look at Man United and extending it into a series. Fantastic. Well, a lot to look forward to, haven't we, uh, as, as, as the months and years go by. An awful lot to look forward to. And I've just looked at the clock, and, you know, we've done over an hour, Harry. Can you believe it? It's been a lovely chat. <laughs> it really has. <laughs> I've, I've got to go and replenish my glass. You have indeed. So, you know, it's that, that stage again. Well, stay Absolutely. on for a second. <laughs> as always on the World of Lord Russell podcast talk show, we could talk forever, Harry, about your life and amazing life as a top sports journalist and, of course, an influential football columnist for three decades, well, four decades, actually, and one of the most acclaimed investigative journalists of your generation in tabloid, radio and TV media. It's been a huge pleasure, as always, and as always, the pleasure is all mine and, of course, the show's audience when this podcast is released on the World of Lord Russell podcast talk show and the Lord Russell Baker YouTube channel. So thank you, Harry. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll give you Harry Harris. Absolute Thank big you. Round of applause. My pleasure. You've been an absolute star. <laughs> you really have. <laughs> so I'm going to wrap up the show now. Do you mind just hanging on for a couple of minutes? Um, okay, can I? Okay, we're up. We'll your glass, actually, whilst, uh, whilst I'm finishing up. I'll Absolutely. do that. Absolutely. Top man. Well done, <laughs> Harry. The next episode on the World of Lord Russell podcast talk show is the six times world snooker champion, where my special guest will be Steve Davis who is an English and retired professional snooker player who is currently a commentator, DJ, electronic musician and author. Steve Davis is best known for dominating professional snooker during the 1980s when Steve reached eight World Snooker Championship finals in nine years, winning six world titles and held the world number one ranking for seven consecutive seasons. Incredible. Steve Davis was runner-up to Steve Davis, of course, in one of snooker's most famous matches 
matches, the 1985 World Championship final, which ended in a dramatic black ball conclusion that attracted 18 and a half million viewers. And it's known now, of course, as the black ball final. Still the largest British television audience for any broadcast after midnight and any broadcast on BBC Radio or BBC Two. So another exciting show to look forward to on the World of Lord Russell podcast show, available, of course, on all podcast media platforms and the Lord Russell Baker YouTube channel. And of course, I'm looking forward to seeing you all on the inside. So until then, it's au revoir from him and au revoir from me.